Hello, everyone. My name is Steve Edelman. I am the founder and director of Taking Control of Your Diabetes, and I also work at the University of California, San Diego and Veteran Affairs Medical Center. Welcome to the first of four deep dive sessions that we will be holding throughout the rest of the year. Today's topic is prevention, early detection and aggressive management of cardiovascular disease and chronic kidney disease in our patients with diabetes. We'll be talking mostly about type two diabetes because that's where most of the data lies. However, these two conditions affect both type one and type two as well. I'd like to do a brief introduction of our two panelists who will be sharing their knowledge and expertise with us today. Dr. James Gavin, uh, he is a clinical professor of medicine at Emory University, chief medical officer for Healing Our Village. Uh, and he's located in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, he has many other accolades and, and has accomplished many other things. But as he just said to me before we started, you're here to hear about our topic, not about us and our background. The other uh, guest is Daniel Blanchard. Uh, he is a professor of clinical medicine right here at UCSD where I work. Um, I'm lucky enough to have Dr. Blanchard as my cardiologist. Uh, and he is the director of the University of California, San Diego Cardiology Fellowship Program. And I've been the fellowship director of our endocrine program. And it's, uh, it's not a small job, but uh, I know he's a great teacher and why he's perfect to share his knowledge with us today. Um, and so welcome you two. Um, Thank you. Okay, well, let me, let me uh, start off with, with uh, some most recent treatment guidelines to set the stage for the rest of the discussion and the question and answer session afterwards. You know, the, the ADA treatment guidelines have changed quite a bit in the last two renditions, and they represent a tremendous benefit for patients with diabetes. So let me put up my slides. This first slide is, is an overall uh, idea of what the American Diabetes Association EASD treatment guidelines are. And I'm gonna let Dr. Gavin get into them uh, in detail in a second, but we're gonna pretty much focus on the column on the left, which is uh, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, chronic kidney disease, or heart failure. Uh, and the other three columns are also very important when you're worried about weight, hypoglycemia, and cost. Um, and so this next slide kind of will help you focus um, on what Dr. Gavin will be focusing on. First of all, you know, obviously the first line therapy is still lifestyle management. It never stops there. Uh, and metformin therapy, unless there's a contraindication. Um, then you should really ask yourself, based on the patient's history, um, is this patient at high risk or already has established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, heart failure, or chronic kidney disease? Very important question that you need to address first off. If the answer is yes, does atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease predominate or does heart failure or chronic kidney disease predominate? Because that will um, dictate whether you pick a GLP-1 receptor agonist uh, or an SGLT2 inhibitor. If the answer is no, uh, and patient not achieving glycemic targets with metformin, you know, obviously you need to consider other factors to minimize hypoglycemia, uh, weight gain, and of course, there's always the issue of access to these medications. So um, at this point, Jim, um, I would appreciate if you could take, uh, take us through this slide, which is the bulk of the cardiovascular uh, issue of the, the guidelines. I'd be happy to, Steve. And first, let me say what a pleasure it is to uh, join you and uh, and Dan in uh, this deep dive uh, presentation and uh, thank all of the folks who have uh, joined us for this important discussion. Now, one of the things that we were talking about before we started the, um, uh, the broadcast was that the, the, the guidelines that we have now, these recommendations uh, that we're gonna be talking about, uh, are fundamentally a lot more patient-centered because they really direct us to um, the thought process that we ought to be using uh, for the full spectrum of the patients that we see in, in our clinics. Um, um, 
and, and all of us see these people. We see these patients who have one or another uh, kind of uh, a vascular disease, whether it's established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, um, heart failure, uh, or chronic uh, kidney disease, or they're simply at high risk for these conditions. And so uh, the first thing we, uh, we note here is that you need to consider uh, uh, these uh, underlying conditions independently of whatever the baseline A1C is or the individualized A1C target. Now, the reason that's so important is that we are seeing this shift away from this really glucose-centric kind of emphasis of what diabetes management means. So uh, it's important that we try to prevent the outcomes that have plagued us for the longest in diabetes, and that is the cardiovascular outcomes. We simply haven't been able to do very much about them. And what these guidelines do is they say, listen, it's still important to reach important A1C uh, targets. It's still important to have goals. But the first thing you want to do is to consider whether or not the person has either established um, uh, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or whether or not that person has indicators of high risk. Uh, the indicators of high risk, as you see here, are um, uh, older uh, age, that is uh, 55 years or, or older, uh, with coronary, carotid artery, uh, or lower extremity artery stenosis, uh, greater than uh, 50%, uh, or LVH. Now, this means that we need to be screening more uh, uh, vigilantly. We need to be able to, to know whether or not our patients uh, are in fact affected by any of these uh, uh, conditions so that we uh, can uh, get an answer to these questions. So if these are not top of mind, uh, then we won't be doing the appropriate kinds of examinations. We won't be asking the appropriate kinds of questions uh, to elicit whether or not uh, th these conditions are present or whether high risk um, uh, factor circumstances actually exist. So if the answer is that uh, to these questions that you heard is, is if the answer is yes, then the recommendation is you should be prescribing either or a GLP-1 um, with proven cardiovascular benefit. And the good news is we now have an array of options. Uh, with the GLP-1s, um, or an SGLT2 inhibitor with proven cardiovascular uh, benefit. And we've got the data from the, the CBOTs so that we now know what the benefits are of these agents on cardiovascular um, uh, outcomes. We know what they uh, uh, are capable of doing with respect to their benefits in heart failure and hospitalization for heart failure, and we know what their effects are uh, in terms of their uh, prevention of progression of renal uh, disease or the prevention of renal outcomes up to and including uh, renal death. Now, if the A1C is above target, so again, glucose control is important, uh, and you need further intensification uh, to um, get better glucose control. Now, if patients are unable to tolerate a GLP-1 and or the SGLT2 uh, inhibitor, which are, as you see here, the preferred therapies for the patients who are in this risk uh, uh, category, you, you um, uh, have a decision matrix here. For patients who are already on a GLP-1, consider adding an SGLT2 inhibitor. And the fact is that the data, Stephen, we may be able to talk about this later, but the data sh uh, showing the additive benefit of GLP-1s and SGLT2 inhibitors is really impressive. Uh, uh, and that probably speaks to the fact that they have somewhat different mechanisms by which they uh, accomplish their benefit. Um, it, and if, if the patient's already on SGLT2 inhibitor, um, uh, then consider adding a GLP-1 that has a uh, proven benefit. You can also use a TZD, but remember if heart failure is an issue, the TZD um, is not uh, uh, an addition uh, that you want to consider. If they are not on a, DP, uh, a GLP-1, a DPP-4 inhibitor. Uh, you never lose the insulin option on any of these medications. Insulin is always a viable 
uh, therapy for additional intensification of, of therapy. And then uh, ultimately, you may even uh, choose one of the uh, second generation uh, sulfonylureas. We have uh, good data with the glimepiride from the Carmelina trial that shows that uh, you have no more risk of hypoglycemia uh, with uh, that agent than a DPP-4 inhibitor under certain circumstances. Now, if patients are, uh, uh, have heart failure, particularly reduced ejection fraction um, heart failure with L, uh, uh, ejection fractions less than 45%. Uh, Here, the data are much more compelling for an SGLT2 inhibitor with proven benefit um, uh, uh, by CBOTs. So that's a patient population where we, we really can navigate straight to what the most effective therapy um, has been demonstrated to be. And, and then finally here, can I, can I, can I, can I jump in there before uh, you get to the kidney issue? I wanted to ask Dan, um, I get a lot of questions from primary care doctors why isn't heart failure part of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease? So why are they separate? Uh, and is the, um, the other thing I wanted to ask is that, you, you know, I, I've been to a cardiology meeting, you know, virtually, they talk about HEF-REF and HEF-PEF, which is reserved ejection fraction and preserved ejection fraction. As I understand it, most people with diabetes have reduced ejection fraction. So those two quick questions for you. Sure. So um, heart failure can be caused by coronary disease, Steve, but that's not the only the only possible uh, etiology. Uh, patients with uh, bad hypertension, patients with a history of uh, dilated cardiomyopathy, often patients with uncontrolled diabetes may have coronary sorry may have congestive heart failure without severe coronary disease. So we kind of have there is an overlap for sure, but we try to keep the two sort of separate. Uh, because the, those patients with bad atherosclerotic disease have a different type of prognosis than those without bad coronary disease. And then as far as the heart failure uh, types, as you mentioned, there's heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, HEF-REF, and heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, HEF-PEF. If you ask most people uh, who, you know, who are not cardiologists and say, well, which would you rather have? <laughs> would you rather have HEF-REF or HEF-PEF? And you have to pick one. <laughs> Everyone outside of cardiology says, well, well, shoot, I want to have a normal ejection fraction. So I'm going to take the HEF-PEF. And that's the wrong answer. It's the wrong answer. HEF-PEF has a worse prognosis because we don't know what to do with it. There's aldactone, there's diuretics. That's about it. HEF-REF, though, we have beta blockers, and we'll talk about this, but beta blockers and a number of other agents that improve ejection fraction over time. So uh, now, in, uh, in diabetes, HEF-REF is, uh, is, a, is a fairly common problem. There is some HEF-PEF as well, but uh, the answer to that question, if you were going to ask it, is that if you have to pick one, you go for the HEF-REF. So is there a cardiology version of Cards Against Humanity? And that's one of the questions that you might <laughs> play when you together. Well, that's, you know what? I really appreciate both of those answers. I have a better understanding now. I'm sure Jim knew that already. Uh, but uh, Jim, I'm gonna let you finish off. Okay, well, but, but can I dovetail a question to, to Dan on that? Because my, the impression is that um, heart failure is one of those uh, cardiovascular complications in diabetes that has for years flown sort of under the radar. Uh, that uh, it's not one of the things that providers, even endocrinologists have been sensitive to as an early complication. Uh, and it does in fact, in many instances occur early just like uh, kidney disease, but we um, uh, see microalbuminuria, so we have some clues there. So the, 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 the question is, is it your impression, Dan, that people with type 2 diabetes who present with heart failure uh, are presenting uh, uh, for diagnosis later than we would ordinarily um, uh, want to have those diagnoses made? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, uh... You know, getting an echo earlier than, than, than what is usually done will give you an idea of an ejection fraction. Anything under 50 is a, is a, a red flag, especially under 45, as you had mentioned in your slides. Um, the problem is that, that heart failure early on is not, may not be particularly symptomatic. So we're recommending more and more early echoes. And then this is off topic, but also 
checking um, hormonal uh, agents to see if they uh, if, if they're elevated um, in patients with shortness of breath, which would uh, push us toward doing more studies on the heart to check the failure to check the to check for for, for failure. Sorry. Okay. We're going to get into that in more detail when we talk about uh, early detection prevention, but uh, some of the repeat information is key. Uh, one last question for you, Dan, if you can answer this quickly. This algorithm that Jim and I live and die for uh, and, and other diabetes folks, are you familiar with that? Do cardiologists know this? Is, do you guys have your own algorithm? Yeah, I hate to say it, but yeah, we do have other algorithms algorithms than this. And, and uh, uh, I think our two specialties have to get together more frequently and, and talk about this because we don't have SGLT2 inhibitors on our regular uh, protocols to look for. And I think that's a, that's a problem that needs to be fixed. And Jim, the, the uh, factor I was talking about earlier was BNP, which yeah. will us if the heart's under excessive stress. But, but to your point, Steve, I wish we had more uh, coordination with this. Yeah, you know, that's really interesting to me. But um, let's, let's continue, we have a lot more to cover. Okay, so let me just quickly wind up then, Steve, with the, uh, the, the CKD, because if the, the, what the algorithm is pointing out here, if there's DKD and albuminuria, preferably, um, you want to put patients on an SGLT uh, inhibitor that has primary evidence for reducing um, CKD progression or an SGLT2 uh, that has evidence of reducing uh, CKD progression that's already been demonstrated in CVOTs, uh, or there are some GLP-1 receptor agonists that have proven CBD uh, benefit if a person doesn't tolerate uh, the uh, uh, SGLT2 inhibitor, or if it's contraindicated, if, if for example, the level of renal function, um, uh, EGFR, uh, doesn't permit it. Even if there's not albuminuria, for patients with type 2 diabetes and chronic kidney disease, uh, th these are people who are at increased risk for cardiovascular uh, events. Microalbuminuria, for example, presages um, risk for increased uh, cardiovascular outcomes. Two things we know for sure. As EGFRs go down and as uh, albumin excretion levels go up, the risk for major adverse cardiovascular events rise. So that's uh, one of those um, um, uh, strongly aligned um, um, uh, interactions that we have to be mindful of. And, and what that compels us to do then is either consider uh, to give to such patients GLP-1s that have proven benefit or uh, SGLT2 uh, inhibitors that have proven CB benefit. The good news here is that we know, and we'll probably get into this, that um, uh, the GLP-1s show their uh, strongest benefit in terms of uh, uh, kidney effects when there's macroalbuminuria uh, present, whereas the SGLT2 inhibitors uh, show uh, impressive benefit on chronic kidney disease in diabetes, whether it's microalbuminuria or macroalbuminuria. Uh, but it's really important, however, that we know where our patients stand uh, with respect to their level of risk in the CKD because the data are really powerful uh, in terms of mitigating uh, outcomes uh, uh, from this high risk condition uh, of CKD. You know, they're getting, they're getting rid of micro and macro albuminuria because it's confusing for people. So it's just gonna be uh, mild, moderate and high and it's just based on, as you mentioned, the amount of albumin, less than 30, 30 to 300, over 300 milligrams per gram. But we're going to get into that more. Uh, I want to uh, take you guys uh, through, whoops, through, well, actually, um, um, I think now, Jim, I'm going to let you quickly go over this slide and I'll put yeah. it, build it for you. And, and this, <laughs> the, the slide tells the story that we, we have a number of, of CVOTs and type 2 diabetes of SGLT2 uh, inhibitors um, uh, where the beneficial results, when you see positive here, that's primarily a result that has uh, shown a reduction in hospitalization uh, for heart failure. Uh, and you see that all, if you go back uh, to that previous slide for a second, 
the, the okay. only one of these that was uh, not positive uh, was the uh, ertoglifosin or the Virtus CV. Okay, the next one. And yeah, and I think I've learned from you, Jim, uh, and you, you folks in the in the audience should know that not all cardiovascular health trials are the same, and there there's different study groups, there's different age, there's different areas of the country. Protocols may not be the same, so um, you can see it's overwhelmingly positive. Go ahead. And, and what you see here uh, basically are summaries of the uh, uh, CV and renal risk reductions that have been found with these SGLT2 inhibitors. And, and this has been a game changer. Um, uh, this is why we can really uh, uh, make such strides in, in terms of what we can do uh, with, uh, with our patients. Um, the, the renal protection uh, that we saw, you clicked off of the earlier slide, but um, the uh, uh, CV benefits on the previous slide. Uh, can you go back to the previous slide? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So Jardians was the first of these uh, um, SGLT2 inhibitors uh, that uh, showed a reduction of risk of CV death in patients with type two and established uh, CV disease. The other two uh, agents, CANA and DAPA in their trials, uh, you see they already have, in addition to the diabetes indication, which is not on this slide, they have these other two indications already. But IMPA has been fat, given a fast track designation um, um, Depend, uh, because of the data from the EMPRA reduced trial. So it may very well be that soon we'll see all of these agents that have uh, dual indications plus their diabetes indication for reducing the risk of CV events and for reducing the risk of, uh, of uh, uh, progression of kidney disease. Uh, yeah, yeah, I was gonna say, Jim, that um, when you look at the ADA guidelines and you say with proven benefits, this is exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, here's the two, uh, uh, here's the renal protection slide. Right. And Please. this is why they already, uh, CANA and DAPA already have that uh, uh, second uh, or third indication um, because of the Credence uh, study. Uh, and these were really impressive results that showed reduction of risk of end stage uh, kidney disease development, uh, reduction of uh, the time to doubling of the uh, serum creatinine, and, and then DAPA, uh, CKD, and we'll talk a little bit later perhaps about DAPA heart failure, which was a separate study, but uh, these uh, have already uh, passed muster and have an indication, and IMPA kidney is an ongoing uh, uh, clinical trial. Yeah, and um, I just realized my computer is on auto change, so. Uh, well, that's maybe, why you've been clicking on me like this. Yeah, so, um, okay. <laughs> and uh, before we move on to the the GLP ones, uh, any comments on the SGLP twos? I can just tell you, uh, and of course Jim knows that uh, nephrologists are using these things uh, quite frequently now, long before the endocrinologist starts them, uh, long before the primary care doctors for the indication of reducing the progression of chronic kidney disease. Oh, you're asking me, right, Steve? Yes. Yes, so um, this is something we've been kind of learning more and more about these last this last year or two, uh, really about the efficacy of the SGLT2 inhibitors uh, in heart failure, uh, particularly in, in HEF-REF. Uh, I have no expertise in renal disease, but uh, I love seeing the ejection fraction rise in these patients. Um, and, you know, some people have said, well, it's just, it's, it's just effectively a diuretic. Well, so is Lasix, and Lasix doesn't improve mortality in heart failure. So I think there must be something a little bit more to this, um, but, but frankly, we are using it now more and more in patients with mild heart failure, waiting, and instead of waiting for them to get to severe, particularly if they have ongoing diabetes, and, and I've been impressed with uh, the the improvement in outcomes uh, with the SGLT SGLT2 inhibitors. Yeah, thank you. That that helps. Um, okay, I'm gonna uh, let you go through this slide, Jim. Okay. Well, this is the other uh, side of the coin. This is the other agent, uh, the other class of drug that has really been a game changer in our ability to change cardiovascular outcomes in patients with type 2 diabetes, namely the GLP1 receptor agonists. 
the CBOTs that have been done uh, with all of these different agents that you see uh, pictured here uh, have reported positive results that have been primarily driven by their ability uh, to generate a reduction. You turn automatic off on that computer, Steve, uh, by a reduction uh, in death due to uh, CV uh, disease. But there also, uh, there's also evidence here that you could uh, reduce uh, other major adverse cardiovascular uh, events uh, uh, in addition to or beyond uh, CV death. And what you see here that the shorter acting agents, namely lixazenatide and exenatide, um, uh, are, are, are the only two uh, that have what we call neutral results. Now, they're all safe. They don't contribute to any increased uh, cardiovascular risk. So th that is not an issue. But with respect to demonstrating cardioprotection or benefit, um, uh, the uh, uh, Excel study with exenatide LR came close, but probably because of its trial design, the pragmatic um, clinical trial design was not the most ideal uh, circumstance for a clinical trial under that set of circumstances. But you can see that we have really impressive positive results across the board here. Yeah. And then finally, the uh, indications that have now been granted by the FDA, the approved indications beyond their diabetes uh, uh, indications uh, for these uh, agents um, uh, are for loraglutide based on the leader data. Um, it's approved to reduce the risk of major adverse CV events. You see all of them uh, in adults with type two and established CVD. Semaglutide, based on the sustained six CVOD, uh, CVOT data, to approved to reduce the risk of MACE, including all of them, CV death, non-fatal MI and stroke, in adults with type two and established CVD. And then in Rewind, the most recent of the um, um, GLP-1 um, CVOTs, it now has gotten approval for the reduction of major adverse CV events, that is MACE in adults, not only with type two who have established CV disease, but also, or uh, uh, those with multiple CV risk factors. And they were able to do this because of the design of their trial. Steve mentioned earlier, these trials are not the same. What Rewind did was it had the largest group of people in there uh, that could be assessed for primary prevention. And that's why now they've gotten uh, an indication that covers both secondary and uh, primary prevention. Dan, you want to make a couple of comments as I take down the slides? Um, yeah, yeah. So, you know, as Jim is mentioning, these, these are game changers, you know. I mean, going back to when we were younger, uh, insulin doesn't do anything for cardiovascular disease in diabetics. Um, the, uh, the TZDs, I mean, all these different agents that lower blood sugar really had no effect on, on heart disease, uh, you know, other than maybe mild, uh, per, uh, mild changes. But now you've got SGGLTs, which clearly decrease the risk of, of major adverse events in heart failure, and these GLP-1 agonists or antagonists which uh, now have uh, effects, clear-cut effects in coronary disease. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm, we're all of an age where metformin was the number one agent you went to a lot of times, and it really didn't do anything for the heart. So I think these, this is a major change kind of in how we look at these drugs for diabetes. Now they, now they can affect decreases in heart failure and in coronary events. It's a big deal. Yeah, thank you. Well, now let's let's turn to early detection uh, and prevention first. Um, you know, I'm, I'm just going to mention two or three things and in getting into your field, Dan, looking at some statistics, and then we're going to get some real specific questions. But when you look at some of the data on cardiovascular disease and especially congestive heart failure, it's unbelievable. And when you actually look at the the, the causes of death in patients with type two diabetes, you know. Congestive heart failure is number one. Um, MI, peripheral vascular disease is, is after that point. And study after study show that people with type two diabetes, they get diagnosed with heart failure younger than their age weight 
uh, match counterparts. And uh, at least 40% of patients were undiagnosed, are walking around undiagnosed. And, and lastly, um, you know, when you, it looks like, but when I look at the data, after you get one episode of congestive heart failure, uh, you know, requiring hospitalization, your five-year mortality really looks pretty serious. So I think uh, the main message to me and to all, all of us people in the trenches is that prevention is so important uh, in this group. So any, um, you want to mention just a few words. We've already talked about the hep ref and hep pep. I can't wait. I want to, I'm a hep ref person. Uh, and, and why is it that people with diabetes is, you know, in terms of pathophysiology, we're not going to spend too much time in that because we're all clinicians here, but uh, what, what is the cause? Why so much congestive heart failure in this group of patients? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and this is a relatively new finding. You know, we didn't really know this several years ago that, that there was this early onset of heart failure. Some of it probably has to do with undiagnosed hypertension. I think that's, uh, that's, that's part of it. Um, there may be something special about type 2 diabetes mellitus involving the heart that we're just not aware of yet. Um, but you're right, the, the, the majority of these folks tend to have uh, hef ref, though not all, um, they tend to be younger, as you mentioned, uh, and then they also tend to have a higher incidence of atherosclerotic heart disease, and that in and of itself can tend to cause uh, lack of blood flow to the heart and, and uh, over time, heart failure. Yeah, and uh, I've heard of RAS activation as mm -hmm. potential. But, um, you know, I, I think what you said is so important. I mean, if you just take hypertension, uh, does obesity have any role of developing congestive heart failure? Yeah, you know it does. Atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, for sure. Yeah, it, it sure does. It sure does. In in lots of things. I mean, in pregnancy, it increases the risk of heart failure. So um, we need to keep that under very good control, and it, it's hard to do. Yeah. Well, let me give you a case. Um, it, you're not going to get much information in this case, but. Okay. Uh, and Jim, you're welcome to jump in after Dan. <sighs> Let's say you have a 53-year-old obese patient with newly diagnosed type 2 diabetes and no previous cardiovascular events, no heart attacks and strokes, no congestive heart failure, no known, uh, but also not followed too closely by a primary care physician, not necessarily throwing them under the bus, just that, you know, patient doesn't go much, uh, they're not dragged in very much, um, and they're really relatively healthy. So what kind of preventative interventions would you suggest to uh, you know, just automatically tell any person with type two diabetes to do. And then we're gonna get after this, we'll get into the early detection and you've touched on it just a little bit so far. So the, this is a, an older woman, a 53 year old woman. Does she have heart failure symptoms, Steve? Nope. Okay. Just so, not to mention, I didn't say she was a woman, but uh, that's okay. We can make her, we can change. Sorry. No, no, no problem. I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay. So I think, you know, you do a standard physical exam. I think you'd get an EKG on anybody like this walking in the door. Uh, and I also feel pretty strongly, and I, I know that not all insurance companies would agree with me, that in somebody who has multiple risk factors for heart failure, even though he or she may not be particularly symptomatic, I still think it's very helpful to get an echocardiogram to see how well the heart's working, to check the diastology, you know, look at the valves. Um, and the government is not thrilled about that kind of a, 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 a philosophy. But, you know, on the other hand, if I can diagnose early heart failure and start somebody on an ACE inhibitor, Coreg, uh, Entresto, you know, whatever, and prevent a first hospitalization for heart failure, I've just saved the government a boatload of money, right? Yes. Yeah. You can't have it both ways. So I, I would lean, and, and again, this is my opinion, uh, I would lean toward getting echoes on these on this population of patients fairly early to look for both systolic and also diastolic dysfunction. So what about ordering a BNP or uh, did any blood tests that you would use that most, most uh, non-cardiologists would not order? Yes, so I would, uh, in this person, I would also order a BNP it's also another type of it is called pro-BNP or BNPP, whatever. It's, it's a hormone that's made by the heart when it's under stress and it goes up. 
Um, it is one of the simplest tests you can do to look for heart failure. So I would definitely throw that in, in on this type of patient. Yeah, oh, Steve, yeah, sure. one, of, one of the things that you, you said that this was a relatively healthy patient and, and that often raises the question for uh, providers, what, what are your first clues of whether for whether this is something you need to be concerned about in the first place? So I, I always think that it's important to ask whether or not the patient has had a change in their level of vigor. Uh, are there things that they do with more difficulty now than, than they did not too long, just months or, or, or so ago? They having problems change in the change in their sleep quality. I mean, the, the, what do you think, Dan? I mean, are there pointers that that might be helpful primary care providers that could give you a clue that at the very least you need to do that EKG and and do a pro BNP? Yeah, no, absolutely, Jim. And 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 they're, they're you know everybody's busy. I understand that, but those three or four questions you just mentioned right there will pick out people who have a higher risk of heart failure in, in five minutes, right? And then based on those on those answers, I think you and I would agree, we'd check a BNP or BNPP and just, just uh, you know, takes takes five, 10 minutes and that's all. You know, Dan, what that's concerns a... me, uh, Steve, is that you know, heart failure can occur so early and it's, yeah. de it's a devil, you've talked to, this is a devastating complication. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it sure is. And then as I mentioned, you know, you get one you one episode of CHF and your prognosis really goes down and it puts you at risk for further episodes. Well, Jim, um, uh, in terms of uh, preventing heart disease, uh, let's talk about uh, lipids and blood pressure next. What would you say are the goals? And I'm gonna have Dan jump in there in a second because they, they change around a lot. LDL, systolic blood pressure, things like that. Yeah, and, and and again, you know, th these these things are are very often sort of age indexed, uh, 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 and uh, and now that I've gotten to be this age, nobody cares about my age anymore. You know, I'm 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 at high risk no matter what. The, but but you do want to look at those uh, 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 metrics. You want to look at, uh, at 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 LDL and 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 people with type two. Uh, uh, diabetes, our focus here, we, we would really ideally want those people to have an LDL level uh, less than, than 70. Uh, 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 and and uh, looking at their HDLs, uh, we want more than 50 for women and less than, uh, and more than 40 uh, for men. Uh, blood pressure, you really want to make sure that you're pursuing a goal of 130 over 80. Uh, as as a, a kind of goal for um, um, people, especially with type two uh, diabetes, and 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 we never want to forget the um, the A one C. You know, diabetes is still a condition where we want to make sure that we are uh, pursuing to the degree that we can A one C targets. And the conservative, prudent goal still is to have an A1C less than 7%. Now, a lot of people say, well, why don't you use the ACE goal of less than 6.5%? I always answer, 6.5% is less than 7%. So uh, it's, uh, it's, not a, you know, it's not a loser under those circumstances. Yeah. Dan, uh, do, you, do you shoot for those blood pressure goals? And see, for us, you know, some, the calculation for LDL these days is too complicated. Now, Jim suggested less than 70 for someone without a uh, prior history of heart disease. And I, I think the lower, the better personally, but 130 over 80 is even lower than the national guidelines of 140 over 90. When I agree with you, Jim, uh, you know, you got to get the blood pressure as low as possible. There's so many beneficial things, heart, kidneys, even the eyes to the point, not to the point where they're hypotensive when they stand up, but pretty darn low. Um, what do you think, Dan? Yeah, I don't want my blood pressure to be 140 over 90. I mean, come on. You know, I want it to be down around 125, 130 over, say, 80-ish. And as far as LDLs, I completely agree. You definitely want it under 70. And in patients with, with multiple stents, you know, there are other agents like the PCSK9 uh, inhibitors where you can drag that, that LDL way down if you need to. But just for a general population goal, 70 or less, I think, is where most people would, would agree. Yeah, that's that's excellent. Now, what about um, aspirin? Let's say someone's uh, what that I know the ADA says if you're 
over 50 low dose aspirin. I believe that's the current guidelines. What, what, what do you think out there? Yeah, it's, that's a tough one, Steve. Uh, there, there, there have been a couple of studies. There were actually four studies in a row out of the New England Journal a year or two ago, which all suggested that in patients in men uh, without known coronary disease, that uh, aspirin was contraindicated because there was more bleeding uh, uh, as opposed to fewer infarcts. And I would just like to throw out there that all of those guys had not been on aspirin before. And if you want to have somebody bleed, have them start taking an aspirin today, right? Because if they go for five, 10 years without any bleeding on aspirin, the odds of them having serious bleeding will be quite low. But if you take thousands of men and right then put them on aspirin, the risk of bleeding is going to be higher. Do so, you think there's any merit in this notion? I've seen these recommendations that if you start people like this on aspirin, that you start them on a proton pump and it would, I mean, do, do you ever recommend that? I generally don't, Jim, uh, uh, unless they have a lot of heartburn, you know. Yeah. Um, but but anyway, Steve, I think I think the, the your question is a good one, but it's it's kind of not steady right now. I think patients with who you might think have got you know diabetes out of control, cholesterol way up, blood pressure not under great control, multiple risk factors you might start a baby aspirin and 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 see how that goes, but that's not based on widespread agreed upon. Yeah. It, it seems so ingrained in our medical therapy. It does. Uh, yep. you know, at 81 milligram, and you know, all based on the, the physician's heart study or the nurse's heart study. Um, I've never seen a patient that had a GI bleed from aspirin. Maybe I haven't been in practice long enough, or I, maybe I just never knew about it. And someone said to me once, <clears throat> if aspirin was a new drug and it went to the FDA, it would definitely be denied <laughs> if you look at the potential side effects. Jim, what, what's your opinion on aspirin? Yeah, I, you know, uh, Steve, I, unless a patient has had uh, no prior events, if we are doing rigorous uh, risk factor control uh, across these other uh, metrics, uh, I'm, I'm not keen uh, on uh, the uh, use of, of aspirins in uh, aspirin under those uh, clinical circumstances. Dan, I got one more quick question uh, before we turn to kidneys. Uh, and uh, Jim, feel free to jump in after me. But my sister is 67. She just retired. She really wasn't going to a PCP much. Uh, she was prescribed statins in the past, but stopped because she got muscle aches at, at, as the pill got to about right here, her first one, uh, as she stopped. But she had a, apparently she had a pretty significant calcium score. And they told her, uh, get a stress test. She passed the stress test. And they told her she needs to watch the cholesterol in her diet, restart the statin, mm -hmm. um, and do more exercise that gets her heart rate up. And so the, the question really is, calcium scores are measured a lot out there. And what's your opinion on those? Should we be yeah. ordering them? So I don't order many of them, but I do order some. Uh, and I think where the calcium score is most helpful is in patients where you're you're kind of hopeful, looking at their data, that they're going to be low risk. And if someone has a calcium score in the range of, you know, five to ten, their long-term outlook is really quite good. The problem comes in when you have somebody with a calcium score of 300 or 500, where the scatter is much higher and it's much more difficult to predict outcomes. Um, and I think that's partly why the uh, uh, you know Medicare does not cover calcium scores in general. Um, they shouldn't cost more than about a hundred bucks if you're going to have one on your own. Um, I, I don't think it's a dangerous thing. I think the the problem is it's it's not a, a, a silver bullet that'll tell you what exactly to do. But in your sister's case, if she had a fairly high calcium score, I would have done the same thing. I would have done a treadmill. And if she passes that, then I'd say, okay, you have coronary disease, you don't have obstructive disease, and so we should get your cholesterol down as low as we can. We should have you exercise, watch the blood pressure, et cetera. So, so let me dovetail here, because Dan, a lot of times when people are getting calcium scores, it, it, it's, a, it's an attempt to sort of establish what is the urgency it, it, to do something. To, to make an intervention. Let me ask a different kind of question, and it has to do with risk estimators. Uh, how useful are these risk estimators for um, the, uh, the development of uh, cardiovascular disease or cardiovascular 
events? And would we be better served if we uh, uh, emphasize their use more strongly as a matter of uh, best practice in people with type 2 diabetes where we're really concerned about making sure we get earlier glimpses of who's at risk and who's not and where on the spectrum they are? Yeah, that's a good question, Jim. So my, my sense is that if you've got a high calcium score, now, now you have diabetes and you have coronary disease. And so that puts you at a higher risk. There's no way around that. Um, and even if you pass a stress test, which would just mean you don't have obstructive disease, it doesn't mean you don't have coronary disease. But so even if you pass that, you're still at higher risk. And so somebody who comes in with a high calcium score, I think of them, you know, as a higher risk person, and I'm going to treat them more aggressively as their cardiologist. Yeah, thank you. Um, all right. I want to make sure we cover the kidney in the remaining few minutes. Um, you know, I mean, I think I just want to say a few stats on diabetic kidney disease. It's, you know, it's amazing that, you know, if you look at statistics, you know, one out of three folks with type 2 diabetes have some degree of diabetic kidney disease, and it far exceeds uh, those without diabetes with the same age uh, and sex matched. And I believe 8% of people with diabetes have albumin levels above the normal range. And Jim, you've already mentioned the five stages of diabetic kidney disease based on EGFR. Uh, you know, we have stages, you know, one, two, three, A, three, B, four, and five, and, and the risk goes up with a degree of albumin from less than 30, 30 to 300 and over 300. Um, and, you know, to me, um, the EGFR tells you how the kidneys are functioning. The amount of albumin tells you if there's how much structural damage there is. So I think those are two very good screening tests uh, uh, that we can talk about. In fact, we'll talk about it now. Um, Dan, uh, Jim, anything, if, if you take the same patient and yeah. you're seeing him or her, you know, for the first time, 53 type two diabetes, what are you gonna do to make an early diagnosis or at least uh, an early assessment of kidney function in this patient? Yeah, so nowadays, Steve, when you uh, send off laboratory assessments of things like um, uh, creatinine, they, they, they send you back an estimated uh, uh, GFR. And, and while there's a lot of noise uh, uh, around that, depending on the patient's uh, uh, ethnicity and, and, and age and so forth, it, it's important to, to get at least some um, ballpark of where the person is, and, and, and a screening uh, serum creatinine is, is a good thing for that. But you also want to get insight on that structural issue, and, and so getting a, 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 a protein um, a assessment, whether it's a uh, doing a microalbumin test, uh, it's extremely important early on because that is the earliest harbinger of a person who is uh, in harm's way for progression of risk for major adverse cardiovascular uh, events. When they start spilling protein, uh, the EGFR doesn't tell, as you've alluded to, doesn't tell the whole story. And unless you know where they are on the uh, proteinuria scale, you, you have no clear notion of where that person is. So I would look for those things very early uh, uh, so I know how to ma monitor this patient. Yeah, I'll just say that the, the urine albumin to creatinine ratio really should be standard on most chemistry panels. Also, I hate it when... Um, I get a EGFR just says less, it says above 60. And I think, uh, you know, 65, know. I'm going to worry a lot more than if it's 95. Uh, so I think the two screening tests, as, as you emphasize, the EGFR and the urine albumin to creatinine ratio are so important. And I just want to tell our viewers uh, that there's a website called Kidney Failure Risk Assessment website. Jim, you talked about uh, cardiac assessment and you plug in the data, the age, the EGFR, the urine albumin to creatinine ratio, the sex, and some of them even ask for phosphorus and calcium. And then they give you a predictor of uh, what, what percent chance of renal failure within a year, within five years. 
So I think I think that's important. And the the urine albumin to creatinine ratio is very inexpensive, and so is the EGFR. Uh, and the other thing I want to point out, you know, we've been talking about asymptomatic diseases all day here, and you talk about uh, kidney disease is you know people don't present until it's late stage, uh, and very similar to hypertension, dyslipidemia, poorly controlled type two diabetes. I mean, all of these conditions are silent killers. And uh, so that's why type 2 diabetes, I think, is so dangerous that these folks do not have symptoms until they're at their late stages. Um, and, and Steve, well, you know, on the point that you're making there, I, I'm absolutely astonished by the number of times that patients that have been sent to me are shocked when I tell them uh, about what we're going to try to do about your kidney disease. And their eyes flare wide open. What kidney disease? Because they have not ever been told. These are people now who have stage 3B kidney disease, and they've never been told that they have any abnormalities in their kidney function. We need to be doing some things that will give us better insight early on. Uh, maybe the uh, more routine use of these uh, risk estimators, just like we are trying to do those for cardiovascular disease, kidney disease. These things are joined at the hip. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? They really are. Um, you know, the, the other thing that is really important for people uh, to avoid kidney progression are things not to do. And certainly, you know, for sure, if you're going to get a medication that may damage the kidney that requires kidney levels, let's just say genomycin, uh, you know, that's got to be super careful. If uh, Dan's doing a, a cardiac cath on you, and you better let, you know, you know, we better train our patients to tell the, the cardiologist, hey, I got kidney disease, uh, be careful with the dye, avoiding NSAIDs, of course, uh, and avoiding intravolu intravascular volume depletion. So, you know, these are just some basic things that people need to know. And that's why education is so important. And that's why we have this organization back here called uh, Taking Control of Your Diabetes. Um, any, any comments on that, Jim? Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. I wanted to push the envelope even further because I, I'm, I'm wondering, well, well, maybe we'll get to this. It, it seems to me that we ought to be asking the question increasingly, given what we know about the risks involved, about the frequency of the complications of diabetic kidney disease and what now can be done with some of the newer agents. Give me a compelling reason why we don't see a lot more people with type 2 diabetes who have early indications of kidney disease on SGLT2 inhibitors already. Yeah, I mean, I, what, I mean just doing this program with you two gentlemen, um, how much under underdiagnosed conditions there are, um, it's, it's amazing to me uh, how little these two classes are used. And if you look at the ADA guidelines, it says irregardless of glycemic control. Um, and so, um, you know, I think we all would agree that access is a big problem. Uh, underserved areas, uh, you know, they just don't have the, the, the ability to get these medications. They're expensive. <clears throat> and I think we really need to, you know, Dan's been talking about the government uh, a lot. And uh, yeah, we have to really use the money for preventative strategies. And this is exactly uh, what we're talking about, for sure. Well, let's, let's spend the last couple minutes. We're not going to get into it in detail, but maybe I'll turn to you first, Dan. You know, we talked about um, prevention, early uh, diagnosis, which is so key in both kidney disease and heart disease. What about aggressive management? I know many of the, there's overlap, but um, if, if you had someone that you diagnosed to be at high risk for cardiovascular disease, uh, what would you consider aggressive management? So I'd want them on a statin, a high dose statin with the LDL, frankly, well under 70 if possible. Uh, if money's not an issue, I might put the person on a PCSK9 inhibitor to get him down in double digits, like 20, 25. I'd get the blood pressure under as good control as I could. Uh, diuresis, uh, keep the person kind of on the, on the dry side. Um, and then, you know, depending on the anatomy, consider... Uh, stents, uh, if the patient has angina, particularly angina that's not well controlled, uh, stents do improve quality of life. Um, bypass surgery, we try to avoid just because it's so traumatic. And uh, the stents that we have nowadays 
often make uh, bypass surgery uh, unnecessary. So on, on a very short note, that's kind of where I would shoot. And then I would try to get the, uh, the S SGLT2 inhibitor around uh, to help diuresis and help prevent heart failure. Yeah, I'm glad you're getting the acronym down, SGLT2 inhibitor. I'll get it by the end of this day, yes. <laughs> See, um, you know what, you, based on, uh, I mean, in the best of all worlds, I'm gonna be having that patient see a, car a good cardiologist like yourself. Um, and if, if, you know, if you're a provider out there without access, there's a lot you can do on your own. And this program covered most of them. Jim, um, yeah. please. Uh, you know, what I'm hoping is that we are moving rapidly based on the data and the evidence that we have to a point where just like the first thing out of Dan's mouth was the use of a statin. I mean, the, you know, we, 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 it's, it's just reflex almost because of the strength of the data and how compelling the benefits have been. Statins are for the heart as SGLT2 inhibitors are for the kidney and people with type two uh, diabetes. I mean, they prevent progression of CKD. They stabilize albumin, uh, um, you know, excretion. So we are looking at a game changer with respect to our ability uh, to navigate to different levels of, uh, of uh, risk now than we ever could before in people with di uh, uh, type 2 diabetes. And I just think we have to push hard to do that. Yeah. Well, Jim, let me ask you this. Um, you know, Dan uh, just talked about aggressive therapy with diagnosed heart disease. Let's say you have a patient that comes in with, you know, stage 3B uh, uh, CKD with albumin moderate to a large. What are some of the aggressive things you're going to be going through? What's your checklist? Well, first and foremost, never forget that this is a person that has to be on an appropriate diet. It has to be on a dietary regimen that is renal protected. Okay. Uh, blood pressure control is absolutely essential. And everything that we've seen in terms of the benefits that have, have uh, been attributed to SGLT2 inhibitors are on top of. Uh, ACEs and R. So those are basically uh, foundational uh, therapies. So those have to be uh, uh, in place. And one thing that we don't talk enough about is the fact that there is evidence that um, moderate levels of regular exercise actually yeah. contributes to renal um, um, uh, health as much as it does to other organ system uh, types of health. So all of those things are, are, are the kinds of things that I would have in place for a patient uh, like this. Yeah. Thank you so much. Well, listen, we're, we're getting close to the end of the show and I'm going to just say a couple summary comments uh, and then we can say goodbye. But um, I've learned a lot from listening to you two and I truly appreciate that. Well, I think if I could just summarize a few things that, you know, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, heart failure and CKD are extremely common in people with type 2 diabetes. And now I know the difference of why heart failure is not in the atherosclerotic category. Thank you, Dan. Uh, they occur earlier and are commonly not diagnosed until end stage complications arise. I mean, so, so many commonalities. Prevention strategies overlap when talking about prevention of heart and kidney disease and early detection is key, especially because many of the risk factors that lead to heart and kidney disease are asymptomatic in their earlier stages. I mean, whether you're talking about glucose control, blood pressure, dyslipidemia, you just don't feel that bad when these values can be high for years and years. And I think lastly, um, the SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 receptor agonists have proven uh, to be such, uh, such important medications in the role of prevention and treatment of these conditions. So. I think with that, I would like to thank you, Dan and Jim, so much for joining. Uh, and now we're going to be answering all of your questions, as many as we can, in the remaining time of the program. Okay. All right, everybody. Thank you for staying with us. So we just concluded the presentation and now our speakers, Dr. Edelman, Dr. Blanchard and Dr. Gavin will be answering your live Q&A. If you did not already get a chance on your screen, you'll see on the right sidebar, there are icons for chat and for Q&A. If you click the Q&A button, it will extend a portion of the screen out where you can type in your questions. And that is what we will use 
to provide questions for our faculty to answer. And I believe we already have some to get us started. So Dr. Edelman, take it away. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Thanks everyone for joining. We have, uh, I, I believe around 200 uh, folks on today, which is really, really good. Um, okay, the first question, um, and I've sort of collated these, <clears throat> both Dr. Blanchard and Dr. Gavin were not uh, excited about aspirin, uh, but what about more heavy duty blood thinners that have been more recently approved by the FDA? Let's just take Pradaxa. I, knew that, I know that there are others, there's antidotes now for it when people uh, may have to stop their bleeding. Uh, when, when would either of you use them? But Dan, let me, let me have you go first because you know, you're the cardiologist here. Sure. So um, up until recently, uh, the, um, the main reason to put people on Eliquis, Pradaxa, Rivaroxaban, the, the, the so-called NOAX, uh, has been atrial fibrillation. Uh, just I mean, in the last year or so, though, there was a fairly large study looking at Rivaroxaban um, in uh, patients with coronary disease at, at low dose. So in addition to aspirin. And uh, that was a positive study. So um, there are people who are at quite high risk, maybe who have had coronary events, where we'll put them on aspirin and then also a very low dose of a NOAC. Um, so that's kind of where we are. And that, that may gradually change as well. You know, I'm familiar with the word Pradaxa. My mom's on it. What was the one that you just mentioned? Uh, River Oxaban or Xarelto? Xarelto. Oh, sure. Sure, I watch television, I know what that is. <laughs> well, you know what? Um, I think they made a big addition to uh, blood thinners versus the old Coumadin days and going in and getting tested and overdosing. And, yeah. and I don't wanna get off track, but my mother just fell, scrubbed her leg and she's got AFib. Uh, and uh, you know, the, the bleeding was manageable and they didn't yeah. even, the doctor didn't even stop it. Jim, did, were you gonna say something? No, no, I, I was pretty much, um... Uh, in the same ballpark. I always talk to uh, my uh, cardiology colleagues uh, about what the potential uh, stroke risk uh, threshold might be uh, to gauge uh, the urgency for uh, using one of these heavy hitter anticoagulants. Yeah, yeah. and I, I would say this, that I remember um, an E to R doctor telling me that the risk of having a stroke um, is like minuscule compared to having a serious bleed with one of these blood thinners. So I, it depends who you talk to. And I, I think Dan would say, depends on the type of AFib. Uh, I, maybe, you know, if you're going in and out a ton, that's probably dangerous, but um, it, yeah. it probably depends a little bit. Yeah, even, even, you know, even intermittent episodes of atrial fibrillation put you at risk for, for stroke. And, and comparing warfarin, which sucks, let's just, let's just say it, uh, versus a NOAC, the risk of intracranial bleed is way lower with the NOAC than with warfarin. So I think warfarin should be used maybe for mechanical heart valves, and that's probably about it. That, that's really good advice. Um, okay, next question, Jim. Uh, you know, we've talked about GLP-1s and SGLT-2s quite a bit. And, uh, you know, when you look at the package insert, it has all kinds of scary things. Uh, you know, uh, medullary thyroid carcinoma, MAN type 2. Um, but what are the clinically relevant side effects like what are what are regular doctors in the clinic really should tell their patients not on the fastenoma side effects yeah i think that when we think about contraindications you know there are relatively few real contraindications for using these medications for example neither one of these is uh, uh, is indicated for type 1 uh, uh, diabetes uh, in both instances, if there's a history of allergy to uh, any member of the class, you should be extremely cautious about using uh, them. But remember that with the SGLT2 uh, in inhibitors, there's a threshold of EGFR that's required for uh, recommended use. And it's important, Steve, that people remember that it, it, it differs, differs from agent to agent. And that threshold is not because that there is some damaging effect of the agent. It's just that for purposes of glycemic control, uh, uh, below a certain EGFR, 
you don't get appropriate uh, uh, glucose lowering, and that's why those thresholds are there. What we've seen is in some of the studies that have been done is that uh, people with relatively low EGFRs, uh, uh, you actually have uh, a protection of the uh, uh, kidney and some of these uh, other protective effects at EGFRs at or below the, the thresholds for glycemic control. The things that we should really now be uh, uh, on guard for with SGLT2 inhibitors, they're new, new kids on the block um, and old kids on the block. Old kids on the block, um, DKA. We really have to fundamentally reteach what people understand about the signs and symptoms of DKA and when to start test testing for ketones if they've been on an SGLT2 inhibitor. We used to say, if you get the signs and symptoms, you know, rapid breathing, nausea, lethargy, acetone smelling breath. We used to say, check your blood sugar if it's above 250, start checking ketones. Don't do that if they've been on an SGLT2 inhibitor. If they become relatively insulin deficient, become dehydrated, get those signs and symptoms, you check for ketones. I don't care if their blood sugar is 160, okay? Because this is a non-insulin dependent lowering and you can get delayed diagnosis of DKA. That's extremely important, euglycemic DKA. And the final thing for SGLT2 inhibitors, T, is this Fournier's gangrene. Uh, th this is a new mm -hmm. kid on the block. The FDA has made this a class-wide labeling uh, where you have erythema, you can get uh, infections, uh, um, necrotizing fasciitis in the private parts. If you're not asking, and if you're not lifting skirts and pulling down bridges, you might miss this. So this is something that you have to really protect yourself and your patients against. Now with GLP-1, <laughs> Hold on. You're lifting skirts on your patients. No wonder uh, you're calling from federal prison. Uh, only, only if they answer the question, yes, you're having redness, you, you know, burning, uh, you know, and, and so forth. I understand. I'm kidding. Yeah, I know, see. But, but finally, on GLP-1s, you know, we, we get a lot more flexibility with terms of renal thresholds with GLP-1. There are relatively few contraindications per se with GLP-1s. Just remember that uh, the, the, there's a federal registry that's been in place looking for these medullary thyroid carcinomas because we don't really know what the relevance uh, of uh, those observations that have been made in rodents, what the relevance is for humans. But if the patient has, has had that condition, a medullary thyroid carcinoma, family history, or multiple endocrine neoplasia type two, it's contraindicated. Do not use it. And I, you need to ask, okay? And so the, 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 aside from that, I, I don't know that there's much that we really need to be uh, concerned yeah. about. Yeah. Um, well, you know what? I, I would have, yeah. <laughs> when, I, when I've mentioned clinically relevant, I mean, how often do we see euglycemic DK type twos? It can happen. And it does happen, especially four days gangrene. But I I would say in, in when I counsel patients, I'm not as scary as you are. Uh, and uh, I say, hey, with SGLT2s, uh, you know, they're, you know, genital mycotic infections is, is the biggest, mainly in women. And if you have a history of genital mycotic infections, it's gonna be a little higher, uh, dehydration in elderly. And then with GLP1s, it's nausea. So I, I, I probably don't go through that exhaustive list, but uh, you did a very good job listing the, the, the important clinical things that you probably should mention, or at least, you know, if you don't know your patient to ask them those questions. Yeah, I, and when I think about clinically relevant, I think about those things that are routine, uh, routine things like mycotic infections, patients should never be surprised by that. And risk mitigation should be standard practice. And the same thing with nausea and vomiting. We should never have a patient surprised about the, the GI adverse yeah. events with GLP-1. Having a surprise is not good. Um, okay, um, Dan, there's been several questions about calcium scores. Um, the, you know, first of all, are there different ways that you can measure calcium scores? I know there's different, sounds like there's different companies out there. And can you repeat again when you would order a calcium score and then how high does it have to be before you start to worry about it? I'm not sure if all the the different ways you measure calcium are standardized. Right. So um, there, there are a lot of different companies around that you can that you can uh, refer people to. Um, I think if you think, 
let me let me rephrase that. If you think someone clearly has coronary disease, like a 70 year old guy with angina, a history of stents, don't waste the money on a calcium score. You're not going to get anything new out of that. Um, a 40 year old uh, man or woman coming in with atypical chest pain um, and maybe a family history of coronary disease, that's more in the in the wheelhouse where a calcium score could be useful. Remember, we talked about this earlier, but a stress test is only going to tell you if a patient has obstructive coronary disease, whereas the calcium score will give you an idea whether they have atherosclerosis in general. And, and the lower the cal the higher the calcium score, the higher the risk. Not a straight line, but but the higher the risk. So, for example, I had a 35 year old um, young man come in who was having chest pain. He was he had a father with a history of an MI. Um, his, cal his, his stress test was normal. We sent him for a calcium score and the calcium score fortunately for him was only about 20. And so I could, I could tell him, look, your risk right now is low. Um, you know, and, and, and that's a very useful test. So I, I think in certain populations, the calcium score can be very helpful, but in patients with known coronary disease, it probably doesn't add a whole lot um, to the patient's evaluation. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, I could probably respond to this one a little bit and maybe Jim. Um, and Dan, you, you know, I'd like to hear your opinion too. Uh, this person is saying that uh, a lot of type ones are sometimes left out when talking about heart disease. And, and you know, the, the, the individual is absolutely right that the most number one cause of death in people with type one is, is heart disease. Um, how do all of these uh, cardiac strategies uh, differ when you approach a patient with type one versus type two? And Jim, you can answer the question of, uh, are these SGLT2s and GLP1s uh, okay to use in type ones? I don't know. No, well, that's one of, one of the things that I pointed out, Steve, is that they are uh, they're not approved for type one, neither the SGLT2 inhibitors nor the GLP-1 receptor agonists. There, as you know, there's a lot of effort to try to you know, push past that, but so far, uh, none of them has been approved for that, for that uh, purpose. And, and it is a, uh, it, it's a major concern. This is a type two focused discussion right now. Yeah, it, it, you're right. It's important to realize that they're not FDA approved at the current time in the United States. Uh, they are approved in Europe, two SGLT2s are approved in Europe, yeah. but not so much for cardiac reasons. Dan, do you have a different approach with type one versus type twos? Uh, do they have more radier vascular disease, more calcification? Uh, what, what's your experience there? Right, well, I, uh, so uh, uh, like, like you guys, I mean, uh, what I see is, well, no, what I see is mainly type two. I don't see that many type one uh, diabetics. Um, I think the type twos have more, you know, have extra problems in a lot of ways. They're often obese, they're often hypertensive, their diet may not be all that good. Um, I don't know that they uh, take care of themselves really well as far as, far as insulin goes. And that, I don't wanna make that too broad a statement, but type ones who are in good shape, you know, I never try to give them advice about their insulin. They know way more about it than I do. Uh, I think they have less trouble with hyperlipidemia, often less diabetes. Um, so I do think they're, they're, they're different. There are a lot of differences. And the ones who have the majority of coronary disease, of course, are the type twos. Steve, I, I would just point out something that, because uh, Dan pointed out earlier in his comments that, you know, I think you, the words you use were insulin doesn't do anything for ASCVD. Uh, and, and, and that's important. I mean, when contrasting insulin versus other classes that we've been talking about, SGLT2s and GLP1s, it's important for primary care providers to hear and for trainees to hear that insulin doesn't cause, it doesn't promote ASCVD, you know, that was one of the concerns that we used to have. Uh, that, that has now been subject to uh, clinical trial uh, evaluation and insulin is safe with respect to its contributions to ASCVD. And that's an important uh, distinction to, to make sure we just keep in mind. Yeah, and I think the algorithm 
one of the big changes in the algorithm from years past, the first injectable should be a GLP-1 versus basal insulin, unless the A1C is two percentage points above uh, uh, the goal, and that's typically above 9%. Jim, uh, a lot of people are accusing us of wanting to put SGLP-2s and GLP-1s in the drinking water. Um, do you, are you suggesting, or have you ever heard of, they should go to those two first before metformin, uh, even if, if someone has early heart disease or uh, kidney disease? Well, I think that if we, if we start with the notion that, you know, up to 20% of people uh, cannot tolerate metformin, no matter how low you dose it in, in the type two uh, population, those people need an alternative monotherapy even. So metformin as foundational therapy is not a viable option for those people. I say unequivocally, that's a population that lends itself to an, uh, an unambiguous yes answer to the SGLT2 inhibitor uh, class as their uh, initial monotherapy. And if there are com sufficiently compelling reasons, uh, for example, for uh, GLP-1, for example, if there's much more urgency for weight reduction, yeah, you, you may in fact, even for such a person as that, introduce them initially to a GLP-1. Uh, receptor agonists. I think that the, the, the game has changed and the algorithms that we have, Steve, do not rule these out. Uh, yeah. uh, it's just a matter of clinical judgment based on the patient sitting in front of you. Thank you. Okay, now for the rest of the questions, try to be brief because they are coming in like crazy. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to combine a bunch with this question. Uh, Dan, um, the question is, um, once again, can, what what, what level do you start a statin? And uh, is there an age difference? And also the, the third part is when someone's statin intolerant, what's your approach and what are your alternatives? And uh, I'd like you to mention like things like coenzyme Q that I think you mentioned to me once a few years ago for people with muscle aches. It's a, a lot of stuff there. So give us- That's a lot of stuff there. Yeah. Okay. Um, so in people with known coronary disease, uh, we shoot, and we've mentioned this number, we, we shoot for LDLs under 70, and I would say well under 70. Um, there does not seem to be a risk to like going down to 20 as far as uh, mental health or anything like that. Um, what was next? <laughs> um, oh, coenzyme Q10. So, so uh, there, there have not been large randomized trials in this because there's probably not a whole lot of money in it. Uh, but I think that particularly in patients who have um, uh, muscle aches uh, with statins, it's, it's worth a try. Uh, and if that doesn't work, then you may have to cut back on the statin and perhaps add Zetia to try to get the LDL low enough um, without using a lot of statin. Okay. And um, of course, you know, getting a PCSK9 um, is, is, is tough to get. A lot of questions on how do you get these meds and we could spend a couple hours on that, but access is a problem. Um, right. I, I, do, I do use, uh, Jim, do you wanna have a jump in on that? Access to some of these SGLT2s, GLP1s, I mean, there are rebates, you may not be eligible. Yeah, they're, they're, they're rebates, coupons, they're um, websites that you can go to and always take full advantage of the, the um, uh, assistance programs that these companies provide. You can get that through your diabetes uh, educators or through your primary care provider easily. Yeah, you're right, the assistance programs. Jim, um, someone was asking, do we still, do we ever do 24 hour urine collections anymore? It's very cumbersome. Uh, and um, you know, there may be uh, some compelling reasons. I, I'm just not aware that they're reliable enough anymore to, uh, to, to warrant uh, the, 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 the drudgery of uh, getting them. Yeah, yeah. Um, Dan, uh, is there any ben what's the benefit of adding a echo uh, to a stress test? I know that you know, you've had me do an echo before and after when I get off the, the treadmill. I just wanna let you know that I go to the gym for like three months on their treadmill faster and higher so I can impress you. And yes, <laughs> it's 15 minutes stage five. And then I, <laughs> I don't know if that helps me or hurts me uh, trying to impress you, but. No, it's, it's, it's good to do that. I, but, but now, now your secret's out, Steve. So, <laughs> so the, the, the classic reason 
to do a stress echo versus just a regular Bruce stress test is whether or not the EKG is abnormal. If it's a normal EKG, the stress test is most likely going to be accurate. If it's not normal, then you can be fooled. There can be changes, for example, in the ST segment that look like it's ischemia, but it's not. So for, for those kind of cases, we definitely recommend a stress echo. Um, and then if the insurance, if it's not an insurance issue, uh, I do think that a stress echo overall is more accurate in picking up ischemia because not everybody has EKG changes with mild to moderate ischemia. So the echo is better in that, in that you can look at the heart muscle at itself uh, during rest and both with that, as well as with exercise. Okay, thank you. Jim, uh, there was an interesting question. They said, can you, can you give us an idea on the acceleration of cardiac disease versus renal disease as it relates to A1C? So, you know, the effects of A1C over time on each of these conflicts each of these two different areas of asymptomatic uh, conditions. Yeah, that, that, that's tough. I think the, the only thing that I think we could probably allude to, Steve, is which of these, according to the data that we have, which appears first in people with uh, um, poorly managed uh, diabetes? And, and it appears that um, um, kidney disease with, a, with the indication of, <clears throat> of microalbuminuria uh, uh, appears to be a much earlier um, complication um, than we ever expected, um, uh, protein excretion. And, um, and, and that is probably a reflection of, of, of the degree to which uh, there may be early uh, contributions of uh, uh, dysglycemia to angiopathy uh, in, in the kidney. But I, I don't know for sure that that's one of those things that we can answer in a hard and fast way. Yeah, all right. Well, um, let me just stick with you for a second this next question. Tom Connect, one of my old fellows at UCSD, he's out there in the trenches seeing patients and um, he wanted you to comment on, well, first he said that, you know, unfortunately the GLP-1s and the uh, SGLTUs are not generic yet. Um, but what about the combination of the two? He uses those all, all the time. Uh, and what, what do you, how do you feel about that combination? And Dan, after Jim finishes, people want to know that uh, if a patient does have a fib, uh, any contraindication to GLP ones? Yeah. So I, I think that the combination of GLP one and SGLT two inhibitor, Steve, is is going to be um, sort of like the cat's meow of uh, of comprehensive. Uh, uh, therapy for retardation and prevention of uh, diabetes-related complications, whether we're talking about cardiovascular, uh, cardiorenal. I, I just think that the data are really, really compelling. And what we know about mechanisms, they have uh, mechanisms that are not the same, but they are highly complementary. Uh, so I, I, I think that those who've already gotten to the point where they have patients who can get access to both, if you can do it, that's a really good call for high-risk patients, especially. Yeah, there's a lot of, oh, sorry, uh, Dan, go ahead and answer, and then I got another question. Oh, uh, okay. Um, so as far as AFib goes, I'm not aware of these agents that we're talking about causing any problems with AFib. There's another question here about what if a patient can only afford Coumadin, and th there, that is a, a, a real problem. Um, and, and Coumadin has been around for decades, and it works. Um, and uh, a lot of patients who are older, for example, who've been on Coumadin for 10 or 20 years, when I bring up Eliquis or Zarelto, they say, look, I'm, I'm fine on the Coumadin. And for people who can maintain a, a therapeutic INR, that's a perfectly fine option. Yep. All right. Um, and people do well as long as you're very good about uh, getting it tested. Um, right. Can you tell us anything about uh, the, the algorithm that cardiologists use? I did see one once, and I thought it was the the most interesting thing I ever saw. It had nothing to do with glucose control. It had to do with cardiac issues, you know, which makes sense. But is there anything that you could tell us what you guys do behind the scenes? Well, Steve, it's a secret. I can't tell you. <laughs> I'm kidding. We, we, there are standard ACC, AHA guidelines and algorithms for this. And, and you can Google them. Uh, I'll look under uh, Jack, American Journal of American College of Cardiology. But you know, you, you made a good point. We, we probably are behind on this 
as far as looking at uh, glucose control, you know, other things like this uh, that, that occur very commonly in diabetics, obviously. Um, I think we're getting better at it, but I would like to see us have more, um, more questions about diabetes in our algorithm, algorithms, uh, which would probably push us to be more aggressive, uh, both in treatment as well as diagnosis. Okay, I'm going to look that up. Okay, I think we're getting close to the end, but Jim, uh, people are dying to know uh, about high-dose uh, GLP-1s. They've been hearing about Victoza, uh, Trulicity, uh, Ozembic, higher doses. What, what can you tell us uh, about those and what kind of weight loss can people expect in their patients? Yeah, they're all of them now, all of the, um, the um, GLP-1s, uh, that includes dulaglutide, liraglutide, and semaglutide have now been looked at at higher doses. Uh, Lyra, of course, uh, has been uh, approved for uh, such an indication as, um, as Saxenda. Uh, and the FDA uh, insists that you draw a sharp line between when you're using these GLP-1s for weight reduction, that is for an obesity indication versus when you're using it for diabetes. And so Lyra is a three milligram dose. Uh, you get about a 5% uh, uh, weight uh, reduction routinely. Uh, Trulicity or dulaglutide at the three milligram uh, dose, uh, you see uh, weight loss of about 8.8 .8 pounds in the 36 week period. But with the four and a half milligram dose, uh, you see about a 10 pound or so mm -hmm. Uh, weight reduction, and you can see that out to 52 weeks. And semaglutide is the most recent one to report weight loss uh, data. You know, that was just reported at the recent endocrine meeting. Here, we see a 17% um, uh, reduction in weight with the 2.4 uh, milligram dose um, of semaglutide. Now, in all cases, Steve, as you know, the, the GI adverse events are... Uh, are heroic, that you have to manage them, uh, but the weight loss uh, potential with these higher doses is quite appreciable. And it looks like uh, there is uh, some sustainability, uh, at least with respect to those that have been looked at over a period of time. Yeah, the, um, you can think about it, 17%. As you know, Jim, uh, the FDA requires only a 5% loss of your body weight to be classified as a weight loss drug. I never could understand why uh, it has to be one or the other because so many people with type 2 diabetes are heavy. But nonetheless, you have to deal with the insurance issues. And I'm hoping that the high dose um, uh, semi-glutide, we can get it more available. I, and, and just to add on to what you said about the GI side effects, I believe it takes like three months to titrate yeah. appropriate dose. But as uh, Dan mentioned, weight loss is going to help uh, congestive heart failure big time, most likely uh, atrial fibrillation as well. 